sweet, sweet spirit in this place. And I know that it's the spirit of the Lord. There are sweet expressions on each face and I know that it's the presence of the Lord sweet Holy Spirit This is a good time to remind you all to turn off your cell phones. <laughs> Indeed. Especially the guitarist yeah. and singer. Some children see him dark as they, sweet Mary's son, to whom we pray. Some children see him dark as they, and oh, they love him too. The children in each different place will see the baby just like theirs, but it's full of heavenly grace, and filled with holy light. So lay aside each earthly thing, and with thyself as offering, come worship now the infant King. Was love that's born, born tonight. Twas 
is love that's born tonight. So welcome. It's a great honor to be here tonight for the 16th annual uh, Derek Bell Lecture. Uh, today's a bittersweet moment uh, of both enormous sadness, but also some joy. Um, the sadness, obvious, we've lost a champion of justice, a beloved colleague and friend. But we're fortunate we're all here tonight to celebrate his legacy and carry on his work. I'm confident Derek would have wanted us uh, to do that. I first want to thank uh, Kimberly Hughes for returning to the law school to open this special evening with such beautiful songs. Uh, she's done this for many years now, uh, but it seems particularly fitting that she should be here this year. Derek, as I think everyone pretty much here knows, had a deep passion uh, for music. Uh, and somehow or other music and the academic work of this lecture series have for a very long time uh, been intertwined and it's hard to know where the lecture ends and the music begins, but that's good. Um, and not only did he weave the music into the Derrick Bell lecture, um, but he also inaugurated the annual Derrick Bell Gospel Choir Concert, um, which is another long-standing and deeply moving tradition uh, here at the law school. And there, I'm not even sure there's a lecture that, uh, that gets mixed in with the music. I think that's just the music. Um, it's really great that so many of Derek's students, former students, colleagues, family, friends are here tonight. Uh, Derek had a profound impact on the law school community. And his death prompted an outpouring of love and support which I've actually never seen here before. Within days, all kinds of things were going on, the Derrick Bell website and the Derrick Bell video, and you're getting emails about having your tribute done, and everyone showed up to these things. It was, it was really, really extraordinary. And most of this wasn't organized by anyone. It just sort of happened, and it was former students and current students. Um, it, it was really, really extraordinary. Uh, Derrick, as you know, had enormous devotion to his family and students, unwavering passion for civil rights, uh, and a dedication to justice it was an inspiration to all of us. He was a leader as a scholar, as a teacher, as an activist. He helped foster a dialogue on the progress of racial reform in the United States. And for t over 20 years, he enhanced our intellectual community uh, here at the law school. It means so much that Derek's family turned out here in full force uh, for the lecture tonight. Derek III, Douglas and Carter, his three sons, his sister Janet, and of course his wife, Janet Dewart Bell, who shortly I will invite to the podium. I've come to know Janet well over the years and she's become an integral part of the law school family. In fact, the Derek Bell lecture was conceived not by Derek, but by Janet. Um, and um, it's the 16th one, so it's been going on for 15 years. And it was a gift to Derek for his 65th uh, birthday. Um, and Janet has turned this lecture into a deeply moving personal experience. It's a particularly moving tonight, but this is not the only time that's true. Um, and it's become a very important platform for sharing uh, the work of preeminent race scholars and activists working for racial justice and civil rights. Uh, and it means a lot to be the Derek Bell Lecturer. Uh, a little later today, I will uh, introduce um, Ian Haney Lopez, the John Bolt Professor of Law at the University of California at Berkeley, who will contribute to this ongoing discussion uh, by talking about contemporary racial equality law. Uh, right after last year's lecture, uh, which was a great talk on the post-racial challenges in the Obama era, delivered by Devin Carbato of the UCLA Law School. I got an email from Derek, as I often did, and he was thrilled to have already secured Professor Haney Lopez uh, to be this year's speaker. Derek was a planner, and this was all kind of worked out quite a long time ago. 
Um, and it's really important and meaningful that even though Derek isn't here with us tonight, he actually had a hugely significant role uh, in planning the lecture and in securing um, the lecture. I think everyone here knows that Derek was enormously devoted to his students. He taught a constitutional law course like no one else ever did and probably n no one else ever will. Um, it was hugely complicated. Uh, students were always writing op-ed articles and there were TAs who were giving comments and there were people commenting on the comments and lots of materials were written and then these very long memos were written evaluating everything and, um, and there were the dinners. The dinners were a very important part of this. I, I, I always got some email from Derek early in the semester explaining how he was gonna run the dinners that year and it was all very well thought through. It was a logistical nightmare, really, uh, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but a terribly effective one. Um, and, uh, and many of Derek's students from years back are here today and, you know, talk to them at the reception. If you haven't heard about this, you'll hear some great stories about that course and other courses uh, Derek taught. The last time I talked to Derek was roughly two weeks before his death. And uh, he was in a wheelchair, and uh, Janet was with him, and they were basically while coming into the Vanderbilt Hall courtyard. Um, it was an obvious, obviously, this was a um, difficult thing for Derek to do. He was coming to teach his seminar. Um, and we chatted a little bit. We couldn't chat long because he wasn't gonna be late for class. Uh, and Derek told me that what he really wanted to accomplish the semester was to be able to finish the seminar. And he didn't quite make it, although he really did because there was so much, the institution was so invested in the success of the seminar because we knew how important it was to Derek that my colleague, uh, Tony Thompson, has kept it going. And uh, again, I think it's being taught uh, with Derek present in spirit in the room and it is continuing. Um, despite endless demands of his time, because by the time of his death, Derek had become an icon, um, he always had time for students and for others. Uh, one student recently said that Derek seemed to have had room in his heart uh, for everyone. Personally, I will miss him a great deal. For me, he uh, represented a number of things that were very important. First, uh, he was, in some sense, um, the only connection uh, that I still had access to, um, to Justice Marshall for whom I clerked, I mean, in that he and Justice Marshall had really been colleagues in the civil rights era. Uh, Justice Marshall, of course, passed away in 1993, and most of the people who had leadership roles in that era have now passed away as well, which is just a product of the passage of time. Uh, but Derek was there. Um, from the beginning in a leadership role and, um, and that was a connection to you know, someone who was uh, my um, mentor. Um, the other thing that was extraordinary about having Derek as a colleague is that you know, in the current world there aren't a lot of heroes uh, floating around. In fact, there are seemingly more than a share of villains uh, and then there are people who are perfectly fine but you know, they're just not heroes, uh, it's a high standard. And, um, and, and Derek really was a hero. In fact, um, for one of these projects that cropped up around the law school right after um, his death, um, it was a video and I sort of did a th segment and he had to do various things, like answer some questions about Derek and then like describe him in two words. Um, and I described him as gentle hero. Uh, those are my two words. And, um, and then Derek was also a connection. I, I think in one of these lectures I described him as a uh, deeply conservative man. I think people were sort of a little shocked by this. Um, but he was, you know, very old fashioned in a sort of, so every year he would, after I became dean, he would make an appointment to come and see me, which was, and, and then uh, he would give me a report on what he had worked on that year. And uh, he'd usually bring me the book he had published and some of these endless memos on this constitutional law course and describe all this to me. And, you know, it was great. But I, I asked him once, Derek, you know, this is wonderful. But, you know, I mean, I'm delighted you're doing it. But 
you know, kind of sort of, I was trying to say, well, why? And he says, well, you know, this is what people did with their deans, you know, back in like 1960 or something. Uh, it, uh, and this is, was his idea of what one was supposed to do. And actually, I really liked it. Um, and, and, and with Derek gone, no one else does that around here. <laughs> so, uh, so it's the passing of an era as well. Um, so he meant a lot to so many of us, and we will miss him very deeply. Um, I'm very grateful to Janet. I mean, she was as dedicated to Derek's students as he was, and uh, she played a very big role in their lives as well. Uh, and together they've done so much to stand up for their principles and to enrich the life of the law school. And I'm so delighted that Janet will say some words to us tonight and get this lecture off the ground. She often has it at other lectures, but obviously tonight is very special. Thank you so much, Janet. Thank you very, very much. Thank you so much. Coming back into the law school this fall with Derek was such an emotional experience. When Dean Rivez, he says, call him Ricky, you know, I'm still old fashioned, I call him Dean Rivez too. When we saw him, we were coming into the courtyard. Everyone from the students to the security guards and maintenance people, the professors, everyone said, we're so glad you're back. We're so glad to see you. And that meant so much to him and to me. I want to thank New York University, particularly the School of Law, and Dean Ricky Rivez and Vice Dean Randy Hertz for being so generous and supportive and loving. I also want to thank Tony Thompson, who's working with the class that that some of us still call Derek's class, but I've said to other people, it's really uh, the class that Tony Thompson and Joy Redis, who is Derek's former fellow, who is in the lawyering program here, who helped Derek conceive this program. He thought that he was going to be able to finish this semester, and we worked very hard to do that. And of course, Derek was all about the students. So I want to thank the students of what became Derek's last class. They have been remarkable. They have continued to keep the faith. They write all those op-eds. They engage in class discussions, and they uphold the ethical standards and the intellectual standards of Derek Bell. I cannot thank you enough. You are a great part of his legacy. The background of this lecture, which I usually give, I'll keep it very brief, is that this started as a conversation with my dear friend, Paulette P.J. Robinson. Should I admit this over a glass of champagne? <laughs> uh, when Derek was turning 65, and Paulette said in her inimitable fashion, so, what are you gonna do for his 65th birthday? And I said, well, I hadn't really thought about it. And she really chastised me. And we, we posed several ideas. We drank a little bit more champagne. And we came up with the idea, well, what is befitting Derek Bell, a lecture series? So we engaged our good friend, the Honorable Robert L. Carter, the judge who, prior to being a judge, was, uh, worked with Derek at the NAACP. And he was just really his mentor and friend for many, many years. We then roped in Valerie Kavanaugh, who's in the audience. So I wanted both PJ Robinson and Valerie Kavanaugh to wave to everybody because they really became what was the... <laughs> the part of the engine for the first lecture series, for the first lecture. The first lecture was Charles Ogletree. 
And it turned out to be, as you know, a marvelous thing and certainly one that Derek has cher cherished very much. I just would like to, even though Dean Revez, also known as Ricky, mentioned them, I would like to acknowledge the family of Derek Bell, besides myself, who's here tonight. First and foremost, his sister, Janet A. Bell, who's sitting in the front row. She likes to refer to, him, to herself as his baby sister, and indeed she is. Sister Janet, so glad that you're here. And of course, the sons, uh, Derek Bell III, Douglas Du Bois Bell, and Carter Robeson Bell. I often say that Carter says, he's the family wit, he always says, I have three last names. The memorial service for Derek will take place tomorrow at 6 o'clock at the Riverside Church, and you're all invited. You can tweet, you can send, put, post things on your Facebook wall. I just used Facebook for the first time last week. Don't tell my, my colleagues who are sitting in the audience and, um, and others. So we would really like a turnout as good as the turnout tonight so that we can celebrate Derek Bell and his spirit. A lot of the work for that was done by Lisa Marie Boykin, and she has to stand up. We have to give her credit. The reason there is so much cheering is she's probably talked to half of you and roped you into one of her various projects to to make sure that the legacy of Derek Bell would be maintained. And she's the one who is the real genius behind the, the website. If you've not seen it, you really need to see it. She, she conceived it, she put it together, and it's just wonderful. So tomorrow's program should be really fine too. We have many people on the program who will be sharing some of their remembrances about Derek. And um, they, they include I should say this, Gloria Steinem, a dear friend. They include Charles Ogletree, and of course, the eulogy will be given by the president of New York University, who is even, he has even a more special title. He's a former Derrick Bell student at Harvard Law School, so he will be giving the eulogy. We will be honored to have Amazing Grace being sung by none other than Jesse Norman, who happens to be with us tonight. and who came to the hospital directly from the airport the night before Derek died to sing to him. And she came to the hospital the next day, about two hours before he left us, to share and to sing with him again. Jesse, I love you. I love you. So, with that, now, for all these years, people, I've been trying to teach you to sing the Stevie Wonder version <laughs> of happy birthday. Some of you got the memo. You got with the program. Some of you were still learning. So I, tonight, because I wasn't sure that my, I was going to be in good voice, I've invited God's son, daughter, Chip Landry, Tracy G, to join Kimberly Hughes. Come on down. Oops, and we're not going to put the spot on the world-class singers besides Kimberly in this audience, Jesse Norman, Stephen Coles, so the rest of you have to sing, and when we get to that slow part in the middle, you have to stay with us, because it will be really short. <laughs> Tracy's going to lead us off. Go. Okay, that All would right. be me. <laughs> Happy birthday to ya. Happy birthday to ya. Happy birthday, happy birthday to ya. Happy birthday to ya. Happy birthday, happy birthday. Happy birthday, happy birthday. Happy birthday, happy birthday, happy birthday. 
birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. It's still my pleasure to introduce uh, Ian Haney Lopez, um, who, as I mentioned, is a John Bowe Professor of Law at the University of California at Berkeley, uh, where he teaches in the areas of race and constitutional law. And the title of his talk is Justice Undone, Color Colorblindness After Civil Rights. Uh, professor Haney Lopez was a visiting professor here at the law school a few years ago. Um, it was wonderful that he is back uh, at, uh, in Vanderbilt Hall. Uh, he taught when he was a visiting professor um, course on debating race in American law and a course on color, color blindness, uh, which is a topic that we will hear more about tonight. Uh, and I have no doubt that he too will have some story to tell about Professor Bell during the year they overlapped here at NYU. I suspect he's not going to sing, but you never know. <laughs> uh, previously, Professor Haney Lopez taught at the University of Wisconsin at Madison. Uh, he was a Rockefeller Fellow in Law and Humanities at Stanford University. Uh, he was a visiting professor at Yale Law School, and most recently, he was a visiting professor um, at Harvard Law School. Just a few months ago, Professor Henny Lopez was awarded an Alphonse Fletcher Senior Fellowship, which recognizes those whose work contributes to improving race relations in American society and furthers the broad social goals of the U.S. Supreme Court's Brown versus Board of Education decision in 1954. He was awarded this fellowship for the research you will hear about tonight and which will form the bulk of his upcoming book. Uh, this research examines the emergence and operation of colorblindness in US constitutional law as an indicator of a new racial ideology aimed at legitimating and preserving the racial status quo. Um, his in his prior work, uh, he published groundworking, groundbreaking books on the social and legal construction of race, including Racism on Trial, The Chicano Fight for Justice, which documents how police violence not only radicalized but racialized Mexican-American activists during the late 1960s. And then more recently, White by Law, The Legal Construction of Race, which details judicial efforts to interpret the white person prerequisite in place in US naturalization law until as recently as 1952. We're delighted that Professor Haney Lopez has returned to the law school for his talk tonight, and please join me in giving him a very warm welcome. This is really a beautiful crowd. It's really a warm audience. You can already tell the energy. Uh, I think the sadness, but also you can tell the sense that people, I think, uh, in many ways, intuit that the sadness needs to be mixed with joy. It needs to be mixed with a sense of community and coming together. So it's a deep, deep honor for me to be here uh, and to address you all. Um, and it's also a deep gift to me to, to receive the energy that, that I feel emanating from all of you. Let me first start by thanking uh, Janet Duarte Bell for the energy, the initiative that put this lecture series together. I also need to thank uh, Dean Revez for that kind introduction. Um, I particularly want to thank um, Kelly Spencer, who has been doing all of the logistics for this. And believe me, with me coming from the West Coast and this and that and the other thing, there were a lot of logistics. All right. So the title of my talk is Justice Undone colorblindness after civil rights. This is an academic title, and what that means is that at least one word in that title must be a pun. <laughs> it's, it's a rule. They'll, they'll take tenure for you, from you, if you don't have a pun in your title. Okay, so justice undone. So undone as in unfinished, clearly I think we all have a sense that justice is yet unfinished in the United States, but I mean undone in the sense of dismantled 
that the gains that we'd made during the civil rights movement have been systematically undone, dismantled, uh, uh, removed, defeated through the doctrine of colorblindness. That's the thesis, that's the idea that I want to explore. Here's the roadmap for my talk. Um, I'm going to start by talking about where we are now in terms of equal protection, but then I'm going to deviate from that, and instead of focusing on the law and the doctrine, I'm going to talk about how we got here. And I'm going to talk about how we got here, particularly in terms of electoral politics, in terms of the Southern strategy, and what I'm going to argue is that the Southern strategy is really a version of colorblind racism. And then in the last part of the talk, what I'm going to say is, how has this colorblind racism in law and in politics shaped the cultural practices of race today? So those are the three parts of the talk. Of part number one, the current state of equal protection, abysmal. Part number two, so okay. Current state of equal protection. Let's start with this question. How well does equal protection protect people of color from racial discrimination today? Well, the test under the court is that you must identify a particular state actor who has acted with a state of mind akin to malice. That's what you have to prove in order to establish unconstitutional discrimination. But that's not the hard part. Right? Proven malice on the part of an individual state actor, that's not the hard part. The hard part is you have to have direct evidence of that. What does direct evidence of that mean? Well, what it really means is you can't rely on circumstantial evidence. For example, if you were, say, Warren McCleskey, a black man convicted of having killed a white man, and you were in Georgia, and you had evidence that somebody like you, a black defendant, but convicted of killing another black, was 22 times less likely to be put to death, would that be enough to show malice on the part of the state of Georgia? Would that be enough to say, listen, the Georgia state legislature that maintains this death penalty regime, that has to be something like malice when they have that gross, that extreme a disproportionality in terms of death sentencing. And the Supreme Court said, well, that's a disparity that appears to correlate with race, but that's not enough. You have to show the malice with direct evidence. Well, what's, what's direct evidence? Direct evidence is going to be a confession. You need somebody to put it in writing. You need somebody to tell it to a journalist. Yes, I'm here discriminating against black people. Right? You need somebody to, to make a videotape of themselves. Right? Now, I know and you know that people will make videotapes of themselves doing extraordinary things. But that shouldn't be the constitutional test. Right? And, so, and, and yet there it is. Uh, what does this mean? This means that since the court articulated this test in a couple of cases, 1979 and 1980, the Supreme Court has never, not once, not one single time, found discrimination against non-whites. Not since 1979, not using this test, okay? And this test is half of what we mean by constitutional colorblindness. It's the first half. The test says malice, blah, blah, blah. The test reduces to only an express use of race is unconstitutional, right? Only an express use of race is unconstitutional. That's the first half of colorblindness. Now, a quick aside. A lot of you understand that anti-discrimination law is much more than what the Supreme Court does. It's much more than what the Constitution provides. So what if you're not looking just at the Supreme Court? Now, what if you're not looking just at the Constitution? So here's a dismaying statistic. For all plaintiffs seeking to litigate discrimination on statutory or constitutional grounds, whether based on race or gender or nationality or disability or age, anybody litigating a discrimination claim in the federal courts, their chances of success, 5%. Only 5% of people who litigate claims of discrimination on any basis in any federal court succeed. And the numbers of those who succeed on the, for, for race discrimination claims is even lower. Right? So in effect, when we say to what extent does equal protection protect, it does not protect non-whites. And indeed, 
the law itself is largely now unavailing as a source of protection against discrimination. That's the first half of colorblindness. Now to the second half. If the first half is only the express use of race will be held unconstitutional, the second half is all express uses of race will be held unconstitutional. We just said nobody's saying race expressly. No. Nobody who's trying to harm non-whites is saying race expressly. But the state, when it tries, and all of us, when we try and address racism, when we try and repair racism, we often use the word race expressly. And the Supreme Court has said, whenever the state uses the term race expressly, that's immoral. That's likely to be unconstitutional, right? And so this is, so this is where we are now. Since the late 1980s, in every affirmative action case to come before the court except one, the court has said, that's unconstitutional. You can't do it, right? In every case but one. Now, you're thinking, OK, this is the doom and gloom part. No, no, this is the, this is the so things are bad now, but they're going to get worse, right? Because this isn't, we're, we haven't seen how bad it's going to be in terms of the law. The law is going to get worse. Here, here's how it's going to get worse. First, I think there's a good chance that the Supreme Court is going to accept cert in a case coming out of Texas, challenging affirmative action. And if it does, there are five votes on the court to strike down affirmative action in higher education by this June. Right? And so that one exception, that one exception was Grutter, the 2003 case that allowed uh, affirmative action in higher education. Grutter's unlikely to survive this year. Second. If you think about the logic of the court uh, in, in one of its recent decisions, parents involved, that logic goes well beyond simply banning affirmative action. It seems to suggest the court, or at least four justices of the court, with Justice Kennedy temporizing, uh, are prepared to say that the government can never consider race at all, even in the context of general policy making. So if you want to think about the government trying to shape policies with respect to housing, or with respect to where to site schools, or with respect to how to provide health care provisions. There are at least four justices, and maybe five, who seem on the cusp of saying the government is prohibited from ever affirmatively considering race. More than that, if you think about the logic of Ritchie, so my, some of you may know Ritchie as an anti-discrimination case, and what, what, what Ritchie did is it, it dramatically narrowed the reach of federal anti-discrimination law. That was bad. But even worse, the logic of that case suggests that private actors subject to federal anti-discrimination law cannot, or will not, will soon not be able to engage in affirmative action. Okay, so in the court now there's a ban on affirmative action, but that's constitutional and that means the state. But the logic of the Ritchie decision suggests that federal anti-discrimination law will soon be understood to ban affirmative action. And if it does, what that means is large private employers could not engage in affirmative action. Foundations could not engage in affirmative action. Private educational institutions could not engage in affirmative action. That's the logic. Where are we, where are we going? Right now, under equal protection, the court will do nothing to protect minorities, to protect non-whites from discrimination. But it will aggressively forbid government from trying to remedy discrimination through race conscious means. And it is likely to begin to aggressively restrict what government can do in terms of anti-discrimination law, and maybe even to restrict the ability of government to consider race at all. And, it's, and it might even be likely that the court is on the cusp of saying even private actors can no longer try and repair racial harms through race conscious means. So how did we get here? Now, in law, typically, we answer that question by saying, well, what did the court say? Uh, and I want to assure you that I have uh, uh, tried to answer that sort of a question at length. But I'm going to spare you. That's not tonight's talk. Let me, let me just make clear. The how do we get here? Let's look at what the court says. The court says some really, truly ludicrous things. 
right? Like, like the court says, well, we have, to, we have to strike down affirmative action because it would be elitist to think you could tell the difference between affirmative action and Jim Crow. Right? Now, that's just, that's just crazy, right? That's just insane. But, but you know, that is, a, you know, okay, that's in the majority opinion. Or one of my favorites is affirmative action is, is unconstitutional because it's divisive. I'm like, I'm like, well, hold on one second. We're trying to resolve majoritarian oppression of a minority. And we're going to make the test of that whether 100% of the majority supports this? Of course it's going to be divisive. It's majoritarian oppression of a minority. <laughs> I, 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 and, and you, court, or an institution that's supposed to protect minorities from majorities. How can the test possibly be, you know, this, this thing's bad because it's divisive? Like, of course, if it weren't divisive, we wouldn't need it. Right? That, I mean, this, okay, so, so this logic is crazy. It's nevertheless very important to engage with what the court has said because the court for the last 40 years has played a very important role in our society in elaborating justifications and in legitimizing the shift to sort of colorblind racism uh, that we've traveled over those years. And so um, I, I want to say, it, it is a very important discussion. Um, this may just be me talking. I've got two long articles on this. I really hope it's important because I did a lot of work on it. Okay, so those articles are out there. That's not what I'm going to do tonight. Rather, tonight, and so I got Derek Bell's permission to do this, um, uh, we're going to go outside of law. So Derek Bell is sort of one of the founders of critical race theory. I think, I think one of the most uh, uh, fundamental insights that he brought is if you want to understand race and law, you've got to step outside law. It, it's not, you can't understand what's happening in race and law within the parameters of the court decisions themselves. You have to step outside law. So we're going to step outside law and ask about electoral politics and try and figure out uh, how we got here. Uh, and the short answer is through the Southern strategy, which is better understood as the rise and popularization of colorblind racism. So the Southern strategy. Let me begin with George Wallace. George Wallace, I know. <laughs> as, as Dan Carter uh, referred to him as the redneck poltergeist. <laughs> okay, George Wallace. So the image that most of you probably have of George Wallace is from his January 1963 inauguration uh, where he vowed to stand in the schoolhouse doors and block integration at the University of Alabama and he proclaimed, pounding his fist, segregation now, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. But the George Wallace, uh, George Wallace I'm interested in is the George Wallace before and after that moment, before. Because in 1958, George Wallace was, by Southern standards, a racial moderate. Indeed, he sat on the board of the Tuskegee Institute. And in campaigning for the governor of Alabama in 1958, he ran against a racial reactionary, and he lost. And sitting in a car with his cronies, smoking cigars, just before giving his concession speech in 1958, he said to his friends, well, boys, no other son of a bitch is ever going to out-nigger me again. And by that he meant, I'm going to the right on race. I'm going to be the racial reactionary. And that's who he was in 1962 that allowed him to win the governorship of Alabama and to give that inaugural speech. And I'm also interested in the George Wallace who comes after that inaugural speech. Because in June of 1963, he made good on his promise to stand in the schoolhouse door. But it was a, a carefully scripted event. The national media was there. And Wallace put away his most inflammatory racial rhetoric. And instead, banning two black students from entering the University of Alabama, Tuscaloosa, George Wallace said, this is about fighting an overreach on the part of the federal government. This is about an illegal usurpation of power by the central government. Now, this was carefully scripted. The federal government quickly nationalized the Alabama National Guard. Uh, the students were in integrated into that school within a couple of hours. George Wallace went home. And over the next week, 100,000 letters and telegrams arrived at his office, half of them from outside the South, condemning him 
95% of those letters and telegrams celebrated what he had done. And George Wallace had an epiphany or three. In an interview with a reporter, uh, and a reporter sort of uh, used these terms to, to, to explain Wallace's first epiphany. They all hate black people, all of them. They're all afraid, all of them. Great God, that's it. They're all Southern. The whole United States is Southern. That was his first epiphany. But it's his second that was more dangerous. His second was that he, George Wallace, had figured out how to tap into that hatred. And the key was to use non-racial language that stoked racial fears, but allowed people to tell themselves they weren't being motivated by racism. In the words of the historian Dan Carter, Wallace pioneered a kind of soft porn racism <laughs> in which fear and hate could be mobilized without mentioning race itself, except to deny that one is a racist. Right? And so here becomes, and so this becomes a standard move. In every George Wallace speech after this, George Wallace says, I have never made a speech or statement in my life that reflected on any man because of his race, color, creed, or national origin. Yeah, right. But that became a standard part of his speech. So that was epiphany number two. And what's epiphany number three? That he could run for president, that he could compete on a national scale on his ability to mobilize white voters through these coded racial appeals. And that brings us to 1968, and this is why George Wallace is relevant tonight. Because in 1968, George Wallace has lost the Democratic primary, he's running as an independent, and he's taking away votes from Richard Nixon. And Richard Nixon sees what's going on, sees that he's losing votes to George Wallace, and understands that to win the presidency, he needs to out Wallace Wallace. And that's what he does. So in his 1968 campaign, especially late in the campaign, Nixon begins to emphasize social issues, such as neighborhood stability, such as forced busing, such as welfare, and more than anything else, law and order. And as he emphasizes all of these social issues, he's always very, very careful never to expressly mention race but to keep hammering away at these issues that he understands trigger racial fears. This is one of his campaigns from 1968 that links civil rights to protest, to violence, and to crime. Uh, there's flashing images of protests, of rioters, of police, of violence, and a deep voice in tones. Let us recognize that the first right of every American is to be free from violence. So I pledge to you, we shall have order in the United States. And Richard Nixon, Watching that commercial in private exalts, that's it. That hits it right on the head. It's all about law and order and those damn Negro and Puerto Rican groups. Right? Nixon knows it's about race, but he never admits it in public. Instead, he puts out all of these different issues uh, that code as race, but that allow people to deny that they're being motivated by race. Nixon barely wins in 1968, but if you look at the vote of Nixon and Wallace together, they get 57% of the popular vote. And the next year, a Nixon operative named, named Kevin Phillips generalizes the lesson of 1968. In a book called The New Republican Majority, Kevin Phillips says, A, Republicans can win if they can break the New Deal coalition that put together white working class member, white members of the working class, Northeast elites, and blacks, and they can do that through coded racial appeals to the whites. And B, Republicans don't need black votes to be elected, so there's no cost to going after those votes. And that is the Southern strategy. Right, that, and Southern strategy becomes the term that Kevin Phillips uses to describe how the Republicans are going to achieve this new Republican majority. Fast forward to Ronald Reagan. Right. Ronald Reagan, when he secures the Republican uh, 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 nomination, holds his first uh, campaign event outside uh, uh, a county fair outside Philadelphia, Mississippi. 
outside Philadelphia, Mississippi, where three civil rights workers had been killed during the civil rights era. And in that context, for the first time, Ronald Reagan endorses states' rights. In going to that county fair, he was taking the advice of a Republican member of the Mississippi uh, Republican Party who would assured him that the Neshoba County Fair, this county fair outside Philadelphia, Mississippi, was an ideal place for winning George Wallace voters. Right? So states' rights. Now you understand that states' rights, that is George Wallace saying he's fighting illegal usurpation of power by the central government. That's the same language. Um, but Reagan, you know, he provided this more colorful language. You, uh, right, you remember all the, the language about the welfare queen, the Chicago welfare queen with 80 names and 30 addresses and four deceased husbands who's making over 150000 a year, right? My personal favorite, I bet this one, this is Reagan talking about welfare, talking about food stamps. He says, food, and he said, he says over and over again at all these campaign events, the food stamp program is a program that allows some strapping young buck ahead of you to buy a T-bone steak while you're waiting in line to buy hamburger. Now, strapping young buck, little too close, right? And so he was subject to a lot of criticism, so he backed off, and then at event after event after event, he said, some fellow ahead of you. But he knew the racial imagery that he was drawing on, and his audience understood that racial imagery. Right? He was clearly engaged in this sort of southern strategy uh, appeal, the use of this, of this coded language. Okay. But then Bill Clinton is elected. So what happened to the southern strategy? It became normal politics. Bill Clinton was elected by embracing the southern strategy. He embraced it during his campaign when he criticized Sista Solja at, at uh, Jesse Jackson's uh, Rainbow Coalition event. He embraced it when he traveled back to Arkansas so that he could oversee the, the execution of a mentally impaired black man, Ricky Ray Rector, so impaired that he asked that the dessert from his final meal be saved for him for the next day, right? And Clinton, after uh, uh, traveling back to Arkansas for this execution, says, no one will ever criticize me for being soft on crime. Right? But Clinton did more than just embrace the Southern strategy as electoral politics. He also embraced it as policy. So it's Clinton who ends welfare as we know it. And it's Clinton who adopts a federal three, thri st three strikes law a and who, and who um, uh, uh, lobbies for a dramatic increase in the number of death-worthy crimes under federal law, um, and who pushes for $30 billion to fund Reagan's war on crime, right? As one report found, the Clinton administration's tough on crime policies resulted in the largest increases in federal and state prison inmates of any president in American history. By Clinton, the Southern strategy has not, has, it has ceased to be the Southern strategy. It is now just the basis on which politicians, Republican and Democrats, compete to be elected in the United States. All right. So in 1964, uh, the, it is frequently said, perhaps apocryphally, that when Lyndon Johnson signed the 1964 Civil Rights Act, he said, we've lost the generation for a South. He was so wrong. Because they didn't just lose the, gener uh, the South for a generation, they've lost it permanently. And more than that, the Democratic Party has lost white majorities. No Democratic president, candidate for president has won a majority of the white vote since Lyndon Johnson in 1964. Not even Bill Clinton, right? And certainly not Obama. Obama f finished 12 points behind in terms of white voting. Uh, if you look just to the South, throughout the South, Obama won 30% of white votes, and in uh, Alabama, 10%. Right? Okay. Now back to the judiciary. What are we to make of the Southern strategy and what has happened in equal protection? Uh, the first and easiest answer is judicial appointments. This is all about judicial appointments. The Southern strategy was looking for coded phrases, crime, welfare, Activist judges. Why activist judges? 
They pushed civil rights too far. They coddled criminals. They allowed affirmative action. They were responsible for forced busing. Right? Uh, and then if you think about the other social issues that are part of what's broadly termed the southernization of politics, courts are responsible for permissive laws with respect to pornography, they're res responsible for gay rights, for abortion, for women's rights, all of these issues are laid at the doorstep of activist judges by conservative politicians or by politicians competing for white votes on the basis of the southern strategy. And so when they get appointed, they get appointed, or I'm sorry, when they get elected, they get elected with a mandate to appoint conservative justices. So if you think about the 40 years between 1968 and Obama's election in 2008, 28 of those years were under Republican administrations, and during that time, 14 Supreme Court justices were appointed, 12 of them by Republican administrations. And here's some of their names. Berger, Powell, Rehnquist, O'Connor, Kennedy, Scalia, Thomas, Alito, Roberts, those are the individuals who are consistently rendering equal protection into a doctrine that won't protect minorities but will strike down affirmative action. Um, and just, just as a quick aside, you notice I've got O'Connor and Kennedy in there and I know a lot of you are sort of primed to think swing vote moderate. They're swing vote, but they're not moderate. They're really quite conservative on the issue of race. And to the extent that O'Connor and Kennedy understood as moderate, it's simply another testament to how far to the right the court has gone on race. OK, um, here's a quote on Reagan uh, on, on judicial appointments. During his eight years in office, Ronald Reagan reshaped the federal judiciary to a degree matched only by Franklin Roosevelt. He named five Supreme Court justices, 78 appeals court justices, 290 district court judges, more than half the federal judiciary. Collectively, his appointees were economically conservative, youthful, white, male, and uniformly hostile to affirmative action. Okay. We could tell the story of what's happened in equal protection simply in terms of the appointments, in terms of the politics around the court and the, and the appointments of judges hostile to affirmative action. But there's another really important element that I want to stress here. The Southern strategy is really a version of colorblind racism. It's colorblind in the sense that it never makes a formal reference to race, except of course to deny that racism is at issue. It's colorblind in the sense that it never makes a formal reference to race. And it's racist, it's racism in that it constantly seeks to stoke racial animosity. That's what the Southern strategy does. So if you, if you just change vocabulary for a minute, the court that's about to enact constitutional colorblindness is put on the court through colorblind racism as an electoral strategy. Right? It's colorblind racism that creates a court that is about to enact colorblindness. And when you put it that way, what happens with intent doctrine, with this whole creation of a malice standard, begins to sound like payback. Because it's the intent standard that says, hey, it's only racism if you make an express reference to race. But these people were all put onto the court by people who were racist without ever making an express reference to race. That is, racism had already changed form so that it could take a non-express form. It had already changed form when, Powell is put, when, when, when Nixon appoints Berger and Powell and Rehnquist. It's already changed form. And so when they turn around and say, Racism is only when you mention race expressly. It no longer seems like, wow, they misunderstood how racism really works. They didn't really get it. There's all this other stuff. No, it looks very different. Now it looks like an effort to make sure that the racial politics of the candidates who put them there could never be indicted. Not, not literally under the doctrine, but more not culturally, not popularly. Because the court was saying what the guys who put us here are doing doesn't count as racism at all, right? That's how the intent doctrine now begins to relate to the colorblind racism of this as Southern strategy. More, when the court begins to announce that it needs to be suspicious of every use of race because you can't tell the difference between affirmative action and Jim Crow, it's saying that at the point where it's already clear that the only express uses of race will be in the context of affirmative action. They already know that because they've been put on the court by a politics that has stopped 
expressly referring to race. Right? And so now we begin to understand this colorblindness doctrinally. It's not just that the justices get there through colorblind politics, but that the colorblindness that they enact is in a sort of a, a close and, and um, exculpatory relationship with the politics that put them there. Okay, third part of the talk. What does this have to do with today? What does it, what does it mean in terms of today's uh, race today if we think about colorblind racism um, uh, as normal politics in the United States? Four quick points. I, I, you, like Four quick points. I, they're not going to be quick, but whatever. Um, okay. <laughs> Point number one, widely accepted. Okay, I've already said accepted uh, Reagan, Clinton. Um, uh, by widely accepted, I mean something more. I mean, even those people who seek to oppose this sort of racial politics embrace the basic structure, the basic legitimacy of that politics, right? That is, that is so I, I, th this is a great definition for an, a hegemonic idea. It's so hegemonic that even those who oppose it really end up embracing it, right? And what do I mean by that? I mean by that Barack Obama, right? Now, Barack Obama, he's really got to worry about the Southern strategy. He's really got to worry about colorblind racism, right? He's really got to worry that, that he's going to be racialized and that all these code words are going to be used against him. He's got a real interest in opposing it. So how does he relate to race as a discourse? So this is from his book, 2006, The Audacity of Hope, uh, where he says, rightly or wrongly, white guilt has largely exhausted itself in America. Even the most fair-minded whites, those who would genuinely like to see racial inequality ended and poverty relieved, tend to push back against suggestions of racial victimization or race-specific claims based on the history of race discrimination in this country. And from this, he goes on to conclude that uh, it makes good political sense that efforts to remediate racial injustice should be couched in universal language, not in the language of race, but, for example, in the language of class. And so he goes on to say, uh, uh, proposals that solely benefit minorities dissect Americans and us and them. We must instead make universal appeals, right? So he's saying, we're going to do something different uh, than the Southern strategy. We're going to try these universal remedies. But listen to the language he uses when he talks about white guilt and racial victimization, right? Those are the frames of the conservatives who talk about the need for repair as simply a function of white guilt and who talk about the gross injustice of racism as racial victimization. He's already using their frame. And he's doing more than using their frame. He's coming to their conclusion. He's ratifying their colorblind aesthetic because he's telling us we will solve this by never talking about race. That is colorblindness, right? Now, I, I guess it deserves a different term. I guess we could call it post-racialism because it's slightly different. It's democratic colorblindness. So let's call it, let's call it post-racial. But it's basically the same thing. That's how widely accepted this new approach to race is. That was point number one. Point number two, it's not just elections, it's policy. And it's policy that over the last 40 years have deeply skewed, indeed have remade America. And if you think about education, if you think about housing, if you think about welfare, you see that that's true. But perhaps you don't see that anywhere nearly as powerfully as with respect to racialized mass incarceration, right? So racialized mass incarceration, 1970, 200,000 people in prison and jail, uh, now over 2 million, with another 4.7 million on, on probation or parole. Right? This is crazy. The United States has 5% of the world's population. It has 25% of the world's prisoners, and two-thirds of those are black and brown. Uh, Michelle Alexander has a great book called The New Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration in the Age of Colorblindness. If you haven't read it, very readable, very compelling, very heartbreaking, hopefully very energizing in terms of a sort of a renewed civil rights and social movement around this issue. But Michelle Alexander says, and I think this is a, a, a claim that she doesn't make in the book, but made in an inter interview later, and it has just an incredible poignancy to it. More black men in prison, on probation, or on parole now than held under slavery in 1850, right? It's just unbelievable what we've done as a society. If you think about, here's another way to think about it. 
we incarcerate five times as many people as, uh, uh, as the, the European country with the highest rate of incarceration. So let's take that rate. That suggests that four out of five people in our prisons do not belong there. Now, so far, I've just talked about numbers. You just need to think about one person. One person. Imagine yourself in jail, wrongly, because of public policy. Your connection with your family strained, if not broken. Your job gone. Your housing gone. Your future life chances vastly diminished. When you come out, you might not have the right to vote. You'll have no right to welfare. You'll be subject to discrimination in terms of housing. You can't qualify for a student loan. And on every job you apply for, you'll have to reveal that you are convicted of a crime. That's just one person. But we've done that to millions and dramatically remade our society in the process. Some other numbers. Because the Obama administration, too, is participating in this politics Every year now, the Obama administration is deporting 400,000 people. More people than we've deported ever before. 400,000 this year, with every likelihood that that number will go up next year, because it's a campaign issue. But again, you think about the lives of just one person, their family connections. I, 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 think, about, I think about people who come to lawyers and ask lawyers to draw up documents to make sure that, that if they're picked up and don't get home from work, that their US-born children won't go into foster care, that instead that they have this power of attorney so they can make sure that they know which friends their children go to. Right? That's what people are doing now. That's what we're doing as a society through this sort of uh, uh, this normalization of colorblind racism as a political structure. Other numbers. Uh, in terms of wealth, median family household wealth for whites, 20 times that of blacks, 18 times that of Latino households. In terms of poverty, 36% of Latino children live in poverty, 39% of black children live in poverty, 12% of white children live in poverty. Um, here's some disturbing numbers. We think about wealth, we think about uh, income. We need to start thinking, we need to start talking more about downward mobility. Downward mobility. Four out of every five black children who are in the upper 60% of income will experience downward economic mobility. Right? Now, the comparable rate for whites is two in five. That's still tragically high. But four out of five, 80% of our children will experience downward economic mobility. Right? Those are just some of the numbers. Okay. It's not just electoral campaigning. It's not just policy. It's the reigning ideology of government that's changed over the last 40 years. And here I want to go just a little bit broader. To really understand what's happened, you have to understand that what's driving conservative politics, certainly what's funding it, is a laissez-faire libertarian politics around big business. That's the Koch brothers, for example. Okay, so libertarianism, this idea that government has no role regulating the economy, that failed as an economic model, as a governing ideology. It failed in the Gilded Era with the Great Depression and it was replaced by the New Deal. But after the New Deal, there was always an effort to get it back, to cut back on the regulations, to allow concentrations of wealth and power to, uh, to, uh, to, to um, uh, move unchecked through the economy. But you couldn't just say that. You know, there, there's, this, there's this leading civil right wing civil rights attorney, uh, Clint Bolick. He's got a book in which he describes how he's going to fight for civil rights. And he says the greatest civil right is actually the right to, to compete economically. And he, and he extols Herbert Spencer. Like Herbert Spencer, right? This is, this is social Darwinism, Her Herbert Spencer? Survival of the fittest, Herbert Spencer? Yeah, that Herbert Spencer. But Clint Bolick issued that book just for the right. Nobody is saying in public, we really want to go back to survival of the fittest, and you know, if, if you're powerful and you make good, good for you, and if not, it's right and proper, you should starve to death. That's just not popular, I don't know, right? So instead, what they say is, we need to make libertarianism popular, populist, by tying it to social issues. 
And what are those social issues? Crime, welfare, abortion rights, gay rights, marriage, activist courts, race. What we've really seen over the last 40 years is the reemergence of a libertarian philosophy of governance that we thought defeated back in the late 1920s. But it's come back. And, it, and this is, so, so uh, I almost didn't get here, by the way. I was, this is a very awkward moment this evening. I was coming out of the Soho Grand, dressed in a suit. NYU kindly arranged for a town car. We come out, and Occupy Wall Street has moved up. And they, they are literally outside the hotel. And I'm thinking, OK, I'm on my iPhone 4, calling for my town car, dressed like this, right? And I'm thinking, if I get mugged by the, the sort of Occupy Wall Street people, it'll be only too fitting. No, but if you think about what they're saying, they're right. If you, if you think about all the numbers I've given you, here are the other numbers that are relevant. The top 1% of the country in terms of wealth controlled 24% of the nation's wealth in 1928. That fell to less than 10% after, by the time you get to 1975 and the New Deal and Johnson's War on Poverty and the Civil Rights Movement. But with the war against the Civil Rights Movement, with the, with the sort of southernization of politics, with the reappearance of colorblind racism as the norm for politics in this country, the wealthiest 1% now again control more than 20% of the nation's wealth. That too is a function of the racial politics of our country over the last 40 years. Fourth quick point. Colorblind racism hasn't just changed our politics. Uh, it hasn't just changed our policy. It hasn't just changed our governing ideology. It's changed the meaning of race itself. Uh, indeed, it's changed racial categories. So in the 1960s, up through the 1960s, race was always biology plus culture. It was brown and lazy, black and lascivious, or black and criminal, right? It was always biology plus culture, temperament, ability, whatever. The big innovation has been to hive off the biological part and to focus simply on the cultural or the behavioral part, with the biological part there lurking in the background but denied whenever you need to deny it. That's the big move. That's the, sort of, that's the move of colorblind racism. What do you get out of that? First thing you get out of that is you get to blame minorities for their position in society because now it's dispositional. It's black pathology. It's brown laziness that explains why the browns and blacks are so disproportionately poor. At the same time, you get to exonerate whites. It doesn't have to do with situational factors, and it certainly doesn't have to do with ongoing racism. And more, you get to celebrate whites because you get to say, well, why are whites wealthy? Well, it must be that they have a culture that, that um, uh, allows them to do well under meritocratic competition, right? And so this is, Larry Bobo has some uh, really great articles called laissez-faire racism, right? Where racism is now expressed in cultural terms. It, it, we, brown and black people, lack the cultural attributes that will allow us to do well under meritocracy. We, you know, family and manana and all that tomorrow stuff. <laughs> Whereas white people, they got it, meritocracy, and that's all that's going on. We just have different cultures, right? So that's the first thing. Uh, second, this sort of new racial discourse in popular culture works a lot like the intent doctrine in the sense that you can never find racism anymore. As long as people never use a race word, as long as they're only talking about behavior, defective culture, um, they can't possibly be racist. Uh, I, I, I've got tons of examples on this. I just want to say, I just want to toss out a phrase. So, so you know all the hysteria about Mexicans and immigration and all of these laws that target illegal aliens. The Klan is heavily involved. Um, white supremacist groups are heavily involved. Neo-Nazis are heavily involved. And whenever you say to them, it sounds a lot like racism to me, they say, illegal is a crime. It's not a race, right? As long as they keep using the phrase illegal alien, whatever they say or do can't possibly be racist. That's the way the new racial discourse works to insulate racism. As long as they don't say spick, they can't possibly be racist when in Alabama they prohibit intermarriage between someone with lawful status and someone who's an illegal alien. Right? Alabama starts going back with anti-miscegenation laws, but don't worry, illegal 
is a crime. It's not a race, right? So that's this other. Now, there's also a parallel to affirmative action. Remember, in a, in, under equal protection and affirmative action, when you use the word race, that's the racism. Same thing in our cultural politics today. Who are the racists? <laughs> because I've been talking a lot about race, which I, I must be a crazy racist. Or this is, this is better. This is, this is the Tea Party writing to the NAACP after the NAACP raises a concern about racism within elements of the Tea Party, right? And I actually thought that that statement was, you know, soft-pedaled, it was restrained, right? But, but here's the Tea Party writing back. It is nothing less than hate speech for the NAACP to be smearing us as racists and bigots. We believe, and you'll like this next part, like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. In a colorblind post-racial society, and we believe that when an organization lies and resorts to desperate tactics of racial division and hatred, they should be publicly called out for it. Which is what the NAACP thought it was doing. <laughs> Last, this new dis racial discourse has not only changed the way in which we talk about race, it has changed racial categories themselves. Right? Racial categories used to be fairly rigid at their boundaries, defined again by the importance of biology, either in terms of morphology, what you look like, or in terms of ancestry. Even if you looked white, if you had black ancestry, you were black. That has changed over the last 40 years. Now, racial categories are defined um, uh, to a large extent in terms of behavior, um, uh, uh, or imputed behavior, culture, and whatnot, in a way that facilitates the rise of what I'm gonna call honorary white status, okay? Now, honorary whites, apartheid South Africa invents that term. And that, basically, they wanted to do business with Japan. And it turned out that under their racial ideology, the Japanese were, you know, racial cockroaches, but that, you, know, you can't do that. People don't wanna do business if you think they're a racial cockroach, right? <laughs> So they said, okay, we'll give you honorary white status and you can come into the country and function as if you're white, just don't move here because then cockroach, right? <laughs> we do the same thing in the United States. We now have an honorary white status and to whom do we give that? Well, we give that to people who through education, through wealth, through professional accomplishment can, are, are now allowed to function as if they're white. This Honorary white status is still color dependent. The lighter you are, the more likely you are to achieve this status. And this, this is both within racial groups, but between racial groups, right? Lighter racial groups, lighter non-white groups, and easier to access whiteness. So it's still partly color dependent. It's fragile. You wanna lose honorary white status, all you gotta do is say, race matters. Right? You just talk about race, do any crazy thing like that, and you're going to lose your honorary white status. Right? So it's fragile. But it's ideologically, it's ideologically incredibly important. Because the presence of honorary whites helps make the claim that race has ceased to matter for everybody. Right? And, so, and this is the incredible important role of Obama. Um, it's also the sort of important role of, especially of those non-whites who are willing to say race no longer matters, Clarence Thomas, Herman Cain. Right? There's a very important role. But, but notice, there has been a real change. Racial categories have eased in the sense that if you would have been considered non-white in the 60s, but now, if you're light enough, and if you're well enough educated in professional accomplishment, and if you keep to this pact of silence about the relevance of race, you can now function as white in a way that you would not have been able to 40 years ago, and in a way that legitimates the sort of racial changes that we've undergone. Here's my conclusion. It seemed that there was so much promise in the civil rights movement. So much seemed poised to change uh, in 1968. And indeed, for some of us, things did change. Things did remarkably improve. But racism adapted remarkably quickly. It took the language of civil rights, of colorblindness. It took the legal tools of civil rights, of equal protection, and it turned that very language, those very tools, into weapons that preserve the status quo 
and indeed weapons that actually allowed libertarianism and concentrations of power and great inequalities to come back into our society. Derek Bell, many years ago, wrote a book, Faces at the Bottom of the Well, The Permanence of Racism. And I was a, a student of his when he was drafting that book. And in the context of that, he shared a sort of a, a, a quote that he had um, uh, to illustrate what he meant by the permanence of racism. He wrote, black people will never gain full equality in this country. Even those Herculean efforts we hail as successful will produce no more than temporary peaks of progress, short-lived victories that slide into irrelevance as racial patterns adapt in ways that maintain white dominance. I first heard that as a student. And I got to tell you, I thought it was silly. I thought he was wrong. I thought he was patently wrong. And what was the best evidence? His presence at Harvard Law School. My presence at Harvard Law School. Right? I mean, clearly, things had gotten better. It's taken me a long, long time to recognize the fundamental genius of Derrick Bell. When he was talking about the permanence of racism, he wasn't talking about me. He wasn't talking about us. Not that those of us who are privileged now, the fundamental genius of Derrick Bell was that he could talk about the poor and the hungry, the incarcerated, those who are working as exploited labor. He could talk about the women who are excluded, even from positions at Harvard Law School. And more than that, he could see the connection between the them and the us, between the subordinated and the privileged, between the ways, the ways in which we were all of us sometimes subordinated and sometimes privileged, and the way that made us all human and interconnected and mutually responsible for us. And it's when you think about all of us, what's happening to all of us in this society, that Derrick Bell seems prescient in 1991 when he writes about the permanence of racism. Because the great promise of the civil rights movement has slid into irrelevance. It was a temporary peak of progress. But race reconsolidated in a way that ultimately did maintain the racial status quo. And in fact, made everyone worse off in our society. Should we despair? Should we despair that this is where we find ourselves 60 years after Brown versus Board of Education, more or less? I want to give Derek Bell the last word here. So in, the, in this book, subtitled The Permanence of Racism, he has an epilogue entitled Beyond Despair. Beyond despair, I am reminded that our forebears, though betrayed into bondage, survived the slavery in which they were reduced to things, property, entitled neither to rights nor to respect as human beings. Somehow, as the legacy of our spirituals make clear, our enslaved ancestors managed to retain their humanity as well as their faith that evil and suffering were not the extent of their destiny, nor of the destiny of those who would follow them. Indeed, we owe our existence to their perseverance, their faith. In these perilous times, we must do no less than they did. Fashion a philosophy that both, ma that mo that both matches the unique dangers we face and enables us to recognize in those dangers opportunities for committed living and humane service. So to Derek Bell, who bore witness to how racism adapted so quickly and yet responded with committed living and humane service. Vaya con Dios, Derek Bell. Vaya con Dios.
Thank you so much, um, Professor Hini Lopez. I know that many of you, um, this is a very provocative talk. It will provoke lots of conversation. Uh, the good news is that there's a reception across the hall, and you can continue the discussion, approach our lecturer, and uh, a couple of things before we actually move across the hall. Janet already mentioned, uh, and I will just repeat it, the memorial service for Derek is tomorrow at 6 p.m. at Riverside Church, uh, Riverside Drive at 120th Street. Uh, and I hope that many of you will be there. But then we will reconvene uh, in our sort of capacity as Derek admirers uh, on Tuesday, February 28th, when the students of our uh, NYU Annual Survey of American Law will dedicate their issue, their 69th volume, uh, to Derek. And there'll be a round of tributes by friends and colleagues. And I hope that many of you will be able to come on February 28th as well. This is a wonderful evening for the law school. It's a very sad evening. It's also a very inspired evening. And thanks especially to Janet Dewar Bell for making all of this possible. Time of his death, Derek had become an icon. Um, he always had time for students and for others. Uh, one student recently said that Derek seemed to have had room in his heart uh, for everyone. Personally, I will miss him a great deal. For me, he uh, represented a number of things that were very important. First, uh, he was, in some sense, um, the only connection uh, that I still had access to, um, to Justice Marshall, for whom I clerked. I mean, in that he and Justice Marshall had really been colleagues in the civil rights era. Uh, Justice Marshall, of course, passed away in 1993, and most of the people who had leadership roles in that era have now passed away as well, which is just a product of the passage of time. Uh, but Derek was there um, from the beginning in a leadership role, and, um, and that was a connection to you know, someone who was uh, my um, mentor. Um, the other thing that was extraordinary about having Derek as a colleague is that you know, in the current world, there aren't a lot of heroes uh, floating around. In fact, there are seemingly more than a share of villains, uh, and then there are people who are perfectly fine, but you know, they're just not heroes. Uh, it's a high standard. And, um, and, and Derek really was a hero. In fact, um, for one of these projects that cropped up around the law school right after um, his death, um, it was a video and I sort of did a th segment and he had to do various things, like answer some questions about Derek and then like describe him in two words. Um, and I described him as gentle hero. Uh, those are my two words. And, um, and then Derek was also a connection. I, I think in one of these lectures I described him as a uh, deeply conservative man. I think people were sort of a little shocked by this. Um, but he was, you know, very old fashioned in a sort of, so every year he would, after I became dean, he would make an appointment to come and see me, which was, and, and then uh, he would give me a report on what he had worked on that year. And uh, he'd usually bring me the book he had published and some of these endless memos on this constitutional law course and describe all this to me. And, you know, it was great. But I, I asked him once, Derek, you know, this is wonderful. But, you know, I mean, I'm delighted you're doing it. But, you know, kind of sort of, I was trying to say, well, why? And he says, well, you know, this is what people did with their deans, you know, back in like 1960 or something. Uh, it, uh, and this is, was his idea of what one was supposed to do. And actually, I really liked it. Um, and, and, and with Derek gone, no one else does that around here. <laughs> so, uh, so it's a passing of an era as well. Um, so, who's for returning to the law school to open this special evening with such beautiful songs. Uh, she's done this for many years now, uh, but it seems particularly fitting that she should be here this year. Derek, as I think everyone pretty much here knows, had a deep passion uh, for music. 
Uh, and somehow or other music and the academic work of this lecture series have for a very long time uh, been intertwined and it's hard to know where the lecture ends and the music begins, but that's good. Um, and not only did he weave the music into the Derrick Bell lecture, um, but he also inaugurated the annual Derrick Bell Gospel Choir Concert, um, which is another long-standing and deeply moving tradition uh, here at the law school. And there, I'm not even sure there's a lecture that, uh, that gets mixed in with the music. I think that's just the music. Um, it's really great that so many of Derek's students, former students, colleagues, family, friends are here tonight. Uh, Derek had a profound impact on the law school community. And his death prompted an outpouring of love and support which I've actually never seen here before. Within days, all kinds of things were going on, the Derrick Bell website and the Derrick Bell video, and you're getting emails about having your tribute done, and everyone showed up to these things. It was, it was really, really extraordinary. And most of this wasn't organized by anyone. It just sort of happened, and it was former students and current students. Um, it, it was really, really extraordinary. Uh, Derrick, as you know, had enormous devotion to his family and students, unwavering passion for civil rights, uh, and a dedication to justice that was an inspiration to all of us. He was a leader as a scholar, as a teacher, as an activist. He helped foster a dialogue on the progress of racial reform in the United States. And for t over 20 years, he enhanced our intellectual community uh, here at the law school. It means so much that Derek's family turned out here in full force uh, for the lecture tonight. Derek III, Douglas and Carter, his three sons, his sister Janet, and of course his wife, Janet Deward Bell, who shortly I will invite to the podium. I've come to know Janet well over the years and she's become an integral part of the law school family. In fact, the Derek Bell lecture was conceived not by Derek, but by Janet. Um, and um, it's the 16th one, so it's been going on for 15 years. And it was a gift to Derek for his 65th uh, birthday. Um, and Janet has turned this lecture into a deeply moving personal experience. It's a particularly moving tonight, but this is not the only time that's true. Um, and it's become a very important platform for sharing uh, the work of preeminent race scholars and activists working for racial justice and civil rights. Uh, and it There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place, and I know that it's the spirit of the Lord. There are sweet. Expressions on each face, and I know that it's the presence of the Lord. This is a good time to remind you all to turn off your cell phones. <laughs> Indeed. 
Especially the guitarist yeah. and singer. <laughs> Some children see him dark as they, sweet Mary's son, to whom we pray. Some children see him dark as they, and oh, they love him too. The children in each different place will see the baby just like theirs, but it's full of heavenly grace, and filled with holy light. So lay aside each earthly thing, and with thyself as offering, come worship now the infant King. Was love that's As born, born tonight. tonight. Twas love that's born tonight. So welcome. It's a great honor to be here tonight for the 16th annual uh, Derek Bell Lecture. Uh, today is a bittersweet moment uh, of both enormous sadness, but also some joy. Um, the sadness, obvious, we've lost a champion of justice, a beloved colleague and friend. But we're fortunate that we're all here tonight to celebrate his legacy and carry on his work. I'm confident Derek would have wanted us uh, to do that. I first want to thank uh, Kimberly Hugh. It means a lot to be the Derek Bell Lecturer. Uh, a little later today, I will uh, introduce um, Ian Haney Lopez, the John Bolt Professor of Law at the University of California at Berkeley, who will contribute to this ongoing discussion uh, by talking about contemporary racial equality law. Uh, right after last year's lecture, uh, which was a great talk on the post-racial challenges in the Obama era, delivered by Devin Carbato of the UCLA Law School, I got an email from Derek, as I often did, and he was thrilled to have already secured Professor Haney Lopez uh, to be this year's speaker. Derek was a planner, and this was all kind of worked out quite a long time ago. Um, and it's really important and meaningful that even though Derek isn't here with us tonight, he actually had a hugely significant role uh, in planning the lecture and in securing um, the lecture. 
I think everyone here knows that Derek was enormously devoted to his students. He taught a constitutional law course like no one else ever did and probably n no one else ever will. Um, it was hugely complicated. Uh, students were always writing op-ed articles and there were TAs who were giving comments and there were people commenting on the comments and lots of materials were written and then these very long memos were written evaluating everything and, um, and there were the dinners. The dinners were a very important part of this. I, I, I always got some email from Derek early in the semester explaining how he was going to run the dinners that year and it was all very well thought through. It was a logistical nightmare, really, uh, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but a terribly effective one. Um, and, uh, and many of Derek's students from years back are here today and, you know, talk to them at the reception. If you haven't heard about this, you'll hear some great stories about that course and other courses uh, Derek taught. The last time I talked to Derek was roughly two weeks before his death. And uh, he was in a wheelchair, and uh, Janet was with him, and they were basically while coming into the Vanderbilt Hall courtyard. Um, it, it was an obvious, obviously, this was a um, difficult thing for Derek to do. He was coming to teach his seminar. Um, and we chatted a little bit. We couldn't chat long because he wasn't gonna be late for class. Uh, and Derek told me that what he really wanted to accomplish the semester was to be able to finish the seminar. And he didn't quite make it, although he really did because there was so much, the institution was so invested in the success of the seminar because we knew how important it was to Derek that my colleague, uh, Tony Thompson, has kept it going. And uh, again, I think it's being taught uh, with Derek present in spirit in the room and it is continuing. Um, despite endless demands of his time, because by the time